Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And once again, my apologies for the continued lists we have these past two weeks. Don't worry, next week I will have another top 10 list video of my top 10 list videos from the past two weeks. It'll be a fun, short video to the point. But that aside, so, so let's go ahead. This video is going to be the top 10, that's not true at all, it's not a top 10 list, I don't know what I'm doing here. This video is going to be the games I added to my collection in the first half of 2021. On a monthly basis, if you're, first of all, if you're new here, welcome, enjoy, please subscribe, all that stuff. But I regularly, every single month, do a video of the games leaving my collection. Some of them are games I've reviewed, others are games I didn't bother, maybe I didn't get enough plays in, I didn't feel comfortable, I just didn't have time, whatever the reason is. If you want a full listing of all the games that are leaving my collection at any given point, every single month, any game that ever leaves my collection goes into that video. But what I don't do as often is the games entering my collection. Most of those will be featured in reviews, uh, partially because, well, if I like it and it's entering my collection, there's a higher chance I'll review it. I'm more likely, I review games I like and don't like, but I'm more likely to review games that I enjoyed because I got more plays and I had more fun and really I just want to share it with you. So that's going to be that. But because of that, I don't do these videos as often. Additionally, sometimes it takes time for me to decide whether a game is staying in my collection. In fact, you may notice, or if you pay as much attention you pay or whatnot, there are going to be games that I've reviewed that haven't left my collection that won't be in this video. This video is designed to be the games that I really think will stay in my collection for some degree of foreseeable future. And with that, and I'll throw links, by the way, to the previous videos I've done. I've done two of these before for the first half of 2020, the first second half of 2020, of 2020. Now I'm doing the first half of 2021. And because there are 36 games on this list, there are going to be two videos, one today, one tomorrow, so that I can break it up into somewhat manageable time frames. And this is listed as in no particular order. And we'll talk about each game as I go through it. Some of them I still have concerns that maybe they won't stay. But for right now, I think I will. And in fact, we'll start off with one of those with Metro X, which is the second newest one on this list technically, meaning I've got my first two plays of it this past week. But Metro X is going to be a roll and write that. It's basically, well, I don't know, it's a roll, it's a flip and write, one of those flip and write games where you're going to have this kind of subway track you're going through in this game. And what you're doing is you're drawing these cards and then trying to check off these subway stations. The puzzle of the game is that the various subway stations all kind of interconnect. So as you fill purple, you're also filling blue and green and whatever else. So you're trying to manage where your subway intersections cross because one of the things you want to be mindful of is that as you continue drawing cards, you're going to be stuck at previous sections. You're trying to balance whether you could skip something, whether you can't, whether you can jump ahead. It can be a few different cards. It's a little bit of a fun puzzle to manage. There are two different maps, but that is going to be the point where while I think it will be around for a while, I really do enjoy the puzzle of it. I'm not 100% certain, like some roller rights before, the lack of variety may make it a little harder. Same game every single time, unless you switch up the map. Obviously, the way the cards come out is going to be different, but there's no variable puzzle to in any way keep this interesting. I feel this either needs an event deck or a whole bunch of, of other maps, so it's constantly different, constantly a puzzle. It's one that I am enjoying for right now. I don't know if it's a long-term stay in my collection, but I think it's going to be around for a decent time. Uh, by the way, one of the things I forgot to do, so I'll actually do this in tomorrow's video, is I like to usually say how the last list fared. Uh, how many are still left? Was I correct about them or not? <clears throat> but with that, moving on to number two, is going to be Cubitos. Cubitos, which I did a review. More specifically, I did a play this, not that, of Cubitos and Quacks of Quedlinburg. Cubitos is going to be a race push your luck style game. You're going to be adding dice to your pool, and you're going to be rolling those dice to further move along a race, but you're going to be constantly choosing which dice work together with each other. Because there's going to be a variety of ways, like Quacks before, there's going to be a variety of different cards and elements that give the dice different abilities. So while there are, I think, seven or eight different colors of dice, the way those dice actually play out every single game will be different. So you'll have a different configuration of abilities, different 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 ways that they all combine in this game. And there are a lot, by the way. If you do the math, it would be a ridiculously high number of the various possible combinations. That said, the overall game is fun. It's push your luck. It's lots of interesting choices to be made. Lots of just movement forward. Uh, now I have, the more I've played this one, I ha I think I still like it more than Quacks, but not I think. I know I still like it more than Quacks, but that gap has closed a bit. Uh, the freshness of it always does bias your opinion to some degree, and Cubitus was fresh to me. It still is fresh. I still enjoy it. I still like it. I still like it more than Quacks, but I like both of these games quite a bit. And yes, I'm looking forward to any expansion content, well, for both of these games honestly. Next up, 
Let's go with Merchant's Cove. Merchant's Cove. This is one. By the way, this is a four to five. I reviewed this one. This as well. Merchant's Cove is a four to five. We got a little corner dent over there. That's unfortunate. Some of these things sometimes happen. Merchant's Cove is going to be a game by Final Frontier Games. And this is a polarizing game to be sure. This is a good time in the conversation to apologize to those new to the channel. There's not going to be extensive B-roll about all of these games. Maybe someday. For right now, I'm still putting out, you know, 10 plus videos a week while holding down, well, two other jobs. So... For eventually, we'll see. But either way, Merchant's Cove is going to be a, how to put this, an asymmetric game where it's basically about set collection and selling goods. It's hard to really explain because every puzzle plays out a bit differently. In the core game, let's take the core game, which is the only thing I've played so far. The core game is going to give you four different characters, four unique characters, whose entire point is to take in resources and then generate various sellable goods. So they're all trying to just generate sellable goods. The way they generate sellable goods is going to be different depending on the character. You're going to have a little bit of potion explosion style gameplay with the alchemist. You're going to have some some just dice rolling with the forge, with the... um. Uh, whatever his name is, the forge person. You're going to have different types of, you're going to have the, 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 the time person and then the, the captain who's trying to send their ships out to collect various goods. So just little different mini puzzles as far as how they generate goods. But past that, you're playing on a central board where you're trying to get those goods sold to the various people who are coming to the various docks and trying to buy the goods. It's a puzzle that mostly comes down to trying to determine which goods are going to be in demand, how can you influence those goods, and then using your own little mini puzzle to generate the correct goods. That's the entire game. That's what it comes down to. Now, I like it, but I like it after having gotten over my expectations for the game. I expected a game that was much heavier and where the asymmetry would intertwine and cross with each other where it really doesn't. You could be playing as the alchemist and I could be playing as the captain and I never need to know how your game plays. It does not matter at all in the terms of the way I'm playing my game. Merchant's Cove is a game that I like. I've seen it being very highly polarizing. There's a lot of people who are disappointed by this game. A lot of people who are expecting something different. A lot of people who rated it accordingly. I've seen a variety of five, sixes, and sevens for this game. But I've also seen people like myself who, once you get past that expectation, really enjoy the puzzle. It is lighter. And I don't know if it's going to stay in my collection for a long time. But it is going to stay in my collection for at least until I can play all of their characters, which I haven't done so yet. I haven't played the expansion characters. At least until I can try the secret stash and see how that goes. I do want to see and explore more parts of the world of Merchant's Cove. I like it for what it is once I learn to understand what it is. Then we have Destinies. Destinies is going to be a straight up five for me. This is a game where, yes, the box is on backwards. That is regularly going to be the case. Destinies is going to be from Lucky Duck Games. And this is one where it's ultimately a narrative based game that's light on mechanics, similar to Isis Vanguard, similar to, I don't know what other, what other games are there. I have, there's a whole bunch of these games out there that are basically narrative games, light on mechanics. And Destinies is going to fit into that category. Destinies is a game where you are using the app to explore this world, and you're going to have the whole, you're going to have your, your characters, your little miniatures, all that stuff. You're going to have skill checks, which are fun, but it really just comes down to the exploration of the game, an exploration that ideally you're going through with other players. I haven't played this solo yet, but I've seen, I believe from what I've seen in general out there, that solo reviews of it are a bit more critical than cooperative, than competitive reviews of it. It just seems that the game is a little bit more random in the punishing nature of what it does and doesn't do. But overall, I really enjoyed Destinies. Destinies. I gave this one a five. I anticipate this one sticking out around at least until I've gone through all of the content. Uh, from there, I'd probably get rid of it because uh, games are constantly coming out and I expect, yes, I would get rid of a five out of five because I expect Lucky Duck to put out more games in the Destiny's universe or system, whatever it is. I'll happily dive into those. For myself, I don't feel the need to dive back into the same scenario when I can instead go through every single scenario in the base game, every single scenario on the shelf behind me, and all the expansion content I have. Once I have gone through everything once, well, if they don't, if they haven't yet announced more content, I'd probably hold on to it just in case because I, I do like the system. But as soon as they announce more content and I've gone through it, then yeah, I'd get rid of it. But that's likely not happening anytime soon. From there, let's go through a trio of small little games from. Button Shy Games. We have a few games that I've added to my collection. Button Shy Games are hit or miss with me. I've probably kept about half of them and gotten rid of about half of them, and then there's a whole bunch of them I haven't even tried yet because I don't feel the need to try the ones that no one seems to talk about. But first of all, we have Skulls of Sedlek. Skulls of Sedlek is delightful. This is my new favorite joining up there with the ranks of Circle the Wagons and Sprawlopolis. Sprawlopolis has eased a bit over time. The solo play in the puzzle, I've gone through it enough times. I have not played Argopolis yet, so that might change things, but since I haven't played it, it's not on this list either. 
But either way, Skulls of like I really enjoy the two-player head-to-head nature of trying to go through a little puzzle as you build this out. I have a review on the channel with Ricky. You can check that out. Then we have a little bit lower down. These two I don't enjoy quite as much as Circle the Wagon, Sprawlopolis, and Skulls of Zedluck, but we do have Food Chain Island and Ugly Griffin in, both by Scott Alms in their solo play version. So these specifically are in the I don't remember what it's called, but Button Shy has a solo line. Some games they have that are solo aren't in their solo line, but these are going to be part of the solo line. Both of these are going to be puzzles. Ugly Griffin Inn involves you managing various guests to your inn and trying to choose where they're going to go and how they're going to trigger each other in different ways. Your goal being to basically survive until the end. It's a little bit of a puzzle. Sometimes you can get stuck in unwinnable solutions. This very much feels like Solitaire. Speaking of which, this feels like Solitaire as well. We have Food Chain Island, which also feels like Solitaire, arguably more so. You're going to set up a whole bunch of cards in a little grid on the table, and then from there you're going to go through basically the food chain, having different animals eat different animals. Like uh, like Ugly Griffin Inn, both of them can wind up with, you know, Kobayashi, Mar Mar Kobayashi Maru situation where you just can't win although I don't know if you I don't know if it's you can't win from the start or if you can't win I assume I haven't worked it out I assume people can figure out a way I don't actually don't know I'm wondering if you can ever wind up in completely unwinnable or if it would be the result of your choices either way I enjoy both of them they're both a fun little puzzle not to the same degree as Sprawlopolis not to the same degree as other button shy games but between the shelf space between the fact that these are games that I can pull out at any given moment to get a quick 20 minute game in just when I want something to you know take a break from working or whatever it is those are fun games that I'm adding to my collection from there I'm trying to think where to go next because there's so many different ways we can go Assassin's Creed. And yes, this is a smaller box because I don't want to pull out the giant box. The giant box will take up all the table space. Assassin's Creed is going to be a game that I have not reviewed yet. Now, I will say, my review of it, I'm not going to, give, not going to tell you any ratings yet. We'll figure that when we actually do the review. But Assassin's Creed is iterating upon the V Commando system by Triton Noir. It's going to be Assassin's Creed, Brotherhood of Venice, and it's going to be... I'll say this. This is what I will say. I've said it before already. I enjoy Assassin's Creed more than more than V Commandos. I backed V Commandos all in when they had their most recent expansion. I may or may not actually play that. I haven't decided. I haven't decided whether I'm going to keep V Commandos as well. There are reasons why I can make strong arguments to keep V Commandos, but I don't know what I want to do. The most basic argument I'll give is Ultimately, Assassin's Creed is one that, unless they start developing one-shot one scenarios in the game, then it's really a game that's played as a campaign. It's really a game that has a sense of progression, and that sense of progression is going to add the value to the gameplay, all of that. Uh, v Commandos, while it does give you campaign elements, it also gives you a set of scenarios that you can go through one at a time. Either way, that will be a conversation for a different video. I'll probably have a review of Assassin's Creed, and I'll probably have a play this, not that, of the two game systems at some point. I don't know exactly when. We'll figure that out. Maybe when the all-in V Commandos arrives, we'll figure it out. But from there, regardless of that, what I will say is both these systems are basically going to be stealth-based games. Both V Commandos and Assassin's Creed are stealth-based games where you're going to be trying to take your, your units, either Assassins or Commandos, and then go through different maps trying to kill people subtly as long as you possibly can, understanding that the more engagements you have with enemy units, whether simply walking into their space, they walk into your space, attacking them, any encounters you have are more likely to cause the alarms to trigger, causing cascading hordes of enemy units to come in and attack you. And this is a game where if you get close enough to your objective, you can basically deal with the baddies and get out. But if you trigger alarms too early, you will lose as you are completely outnumbered by enemy forces. Uh, v Commandos, Assassin's Creed, I mean, Assassin's Creed iterates upon that system in ways that I believe are mostly positive, mostly improvements to that system. A lot of things will go into it at some point, but overall, I expect Assassin's Creed to last quite some time in my collection. Like Destiny's, once I've gone through all the expansion content, I have to question whether I'm keeping it. In general, when it comes to just the constant games that are coming out, the fact that we always have new games and there are always going to be good games coming out, I always have to question when, if I'm done with a campaign-based system, do I consider that a good opportunity to stop, to pause, and to move on? We'll see. That is a, a decision for tomorrow, not a decision for today. Which brings us... That was a mistake. I forgot that there is no uh, insert in this game. I kind of, oh, that was messy. I forgot that I put my miniatures in here just literally just laying on their side because I wasn't going to turn this box on its side. Wild Ascent. Wild Ascent, a game that is currently on GameFound. Depending on when this video goes up, this video go is going up, I believe, on a Thursday. 
this game, while it's at Levon Rising, either just ended on GameFound or it's its last day or something. I have to do the math on it. Either way, there will be a late pledge available for that game. Wild Descent is a game that I had the opportunity to play in 2021, and I adore this game. It has campaign play. Now, unlike Assassin's Creed, where there's some element of a story to the campaign, the campaign play and an element of progression, unlike Destiny's, where it's much more narrative driven, the campaign play, campaign play in Wild Descent, at least the campaign I played from the base game, is not about the narrative. It's literally just 10 missions. The goal is not a campaign with progression and story and all that. The goal is pick four characters, slowly level them up as you go through the wilds, hunting creatures, attacking creatures, and generally trying to survive. But if you want story and you want replayability, Levon Rising is going to give you both a campaign as well as a replayable campaign because it's going to be giving you branching pathways, branching pathways that are immensely fun to go through. Uh, the testimony I have up on the Levon Rising page is literally, this is a game that has done what no other game has ever made me do, which is I, outside of playing the game, I went through different branching paths because I just wanted to see how different things ended story-wise. I literally just wanted to see the differences. So I am intrigued both in the story of the Vine Rising. I'm very excited for Storm Sunder as well because of this. But Wild Descent is a game that will be in my collection for quite some time. I'm really enjoying what it does. The biggest con I have for it is that I have to effectively be ready to dive into a 10 campaign scenario in order to play the game, which is something that's a little harder for me. I don't go, I don't go deep on games as much as I would like to. I go far more wide. I play a lot of different games, but the number of games that I play 10 times is, is a small number. And the number of games I'm going to sit there and say, you know what? It's time. Like when the Von Rising gets here, I'm going to play through a 10 game campaign because I'll want to go through it. But then I'll box it up, put it on the shelf. And then at a certain point, I'll have to be ready again. So it's a little bit of a challenge. Any campaign game is always fighting a bit of an uphill battle once I've mentally gotten past it. Even Assassin's Creed, which I'm currently like, I don't know, 12, I'm 12 games in, but about eight campaign missions in or whatever it is. Uh, even that right now, I have to question. Do I continue going through it or do I box it up and then hope I pull it out again? This is always harder. Uh, these games that require more sessions, you have to mentally get in the space, at least for myself. Next up, we have Nidavellir. There's going to be a variety of games on this list that do not have that campaign problem. Nidavellir is going to be a delightful game in the vein of games like Splendor and Century Spice Road before it. Games, not gameplay-wise necessarily, but rather just the general idea that they give you a, a sense of appealing and fun and interesting gameplay to them. And then, this is getting a little too reflecting off lights, uh, gives you a sense of fun and gameplay to them, and they are addicting. You kind of want to die back in and play it again and play it again as you slowly just build up tableaus of points. In the Devalier, you're specifically trying to collect sets of cards. Now, some of those cards are going to be points scoring deep, meaning the more cards you get of a certain color, you'll score tons of points for them. All of the cards reward you that way. But you're also going to get points for going wide. As you collect five different colors, you get bonus cards that will trigger amazing fun things. So you're doing a combination of going wide a little bit and then going deep as well, trying to balance which way is most efficiently going to score you massive amounts of points by the time the game is done. Uh, the thing of other expansion I would consider necessary in terms of keeping this game fresh over time. Otherwise, I think it can or would lose its luster after a certain number of plays. But notably, I expect it to be in my collection for a while. Next up, we have Cat Lady. There's going to be a few games that are family-friendly, kid-focused on this list. Uh, again, these are just all games I played in the first half of 2021 and I'm excited to keep. There are other games, I touched upon this at the beginning, there are other games that I played in the first half of 2021 that I'm still on the fence about and thus aren't on this list. They may not have left my collection, but I don't know if they're staying long-term. Long-term for me, by the way, is anything I put on this list, I would expect to be around either until I'm fully done with the, whatever the campaign system is, or alternatively for at least a year. That's what I consider long-term for myself and my collection. I'll be wrong with some of them. Some of them I'll change my mind on, but that's what makes the cut over here. Cat Lady. Cat Lady is a lightweight game that I've enjoyed playing with my wife. I've enjoyed playing with my daughter. Uh, it's a fun little set collection style game. You're going to be trying to get various cats, feed those cats, get toys. It's simple and easy to play. It's one that it's it's one of these many games that it's not that it's immensely rewarding. I think I gave this a three, if I'm not mistaken. I enjoy it. Easy to table, fun to play, and can play with a variety of people. This is from AEG. We have Trails of Takana. Trails of Takana is going to be one of many, many roll and rights. Roll and rights in general do very much fall in that category of games that I enjoy, I play, and then a year later, I might move on from it or not. Uh, Silver and Gold is a game that I just got rid of this past uh, Games League My Collection. It's a great game. I had it for a long time. I played it. I enjoyed it. But Metro X, Tra Trails to Kana, some roll and rights give you enough variability to stay interesting. Some do not. Trails to Kana, like Metro X, is going to be a fun little puzzle, but one that I question the variability long term. Trails to Kana involves basically wandering around a jungle map. You're going to be drawing different cars and collecting, connecting lines between different terrain types in this game. I think it's a lot of fun. It's very unique in what it does. I think that like Metro X, it likely needs an expansion to keep it fresh and interesting time and time again. Otherwise, the puzzle 
as enjoyable as it is as you try to connect different elements as you look at the train cars and say well I'll draw a forest to a mountain but if I do that I have like four forest to mountains I need to figure out a different path because you need to be flexible you need to be very you need to have variability on your board that any combination of terrain cards that pop up you can draw a line between them it's a little bit of a puzzle in this in the way you build out your things so that you don't end up getting hit with pure luck of the draw that's gonna be again a commonality with metro x it's not it's about all players are given the same puzzle and it's about you to build the most efficient connections that will give you the points you need no matter what the game throws at you next that's going to be trails of Tucano. then from there we have mia london mia london and the uh Sca the case of the 625 scoundrels this is a very light and silly game it's a three to five for me i enjoy it i like it i've reviewed it with ricky on the channel but basically this is barely even a game it's more of a kind of memory system you're gonna have this flip book of puzzles you're gonna have different cards with different features so uh mustaches hats glasses and something else bow tie bow tie i think it is and each of those features define who the scoundrel is and who the cro the crook is that you're trying to hunt down. And from there, you're going to be down playing out cards, and the, it's the player's job to see which feature is missing. So you're rapidly going through the cards, and at the end, they adjust their flipbook to try to match. I think that monocle was missing. I think the monocle is missing. Therefore, the crook was the monocle. So it's a little bit of a, a memory game of knowing what's available and then kind, kind of trying to track what's missing when the cards are hastily played. A very interesting, enjoyable game. It's quick. It's simple. It's fun. It's one that I enjoy playing with my kids. And I think it'll be around for a while because it's, it's different. It's very different in what it's doing. Next up, we have Canvas. Canvas is going to be one of those games. And this is rare for me. So... Something I do track is, and I track, I'll be making this publicly available at some point, but something I do track is my initial review of a game versus my later review. Now, more often than not, games go down over time, not up. Not always, but more often than not. Uh, usually once I have a review of a game, once I sit there and say, hey, this is a four to five, it is more likely that over time, the luster of the game, the puzzle, the interesting parts that made the game fresh and interesting will slowly move it down to a three for me. It's, uh, it's nothing to do with the game being bad. It's just that, I like games, I like freshness, I like things that are interesting, and yeah, you know, two years from now when I'm playing the same game, it's still fun, it's just not as new, it's not as interesting. There's only so many times you can watch Gladiator, that's a bald face lie, there's no time, there's no limit to the amount of times you can watch Gladiator, but most movies do get less interesting the more you watch them, and I think that's true for games as well. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean most of my games go down quickly, they don't at all. I would say most of my games hold their rating for a while, but two, three years down the road, they change. That said, even in the first year, there are going to be a variety of games in my collection where I review it, and then it goes down. Dune Imperium is a great example. Dune Imperium started as a five. I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. And then the more I played Arnak and the more I played Dune Imperium, the more Arnak went up for me from five to five. Didn't really change in that sense. But Dune Imperium did move down to a four. It does happen. Canvas is going to be one of those few games that moved up. And it does happen as well when games do move up, but Canvas definitely moved up. Canvas is a game that I initially rated a three. I enjoyed it. I liked it. I thought this was a fun, clever game. But the more I played it, the more I enjoyed it. And this is one that's seen a lot of play in our house because of how accessible it is, both to gamers, both to non-gamers, whatever the age range. Canvas is a game that's all about building a canvas, building a painting. But really, depends on who you are. That might be the game for some people. To others like myself, the game is about the combination of puzzly objectives and drafting different cards that, sure, might result in a gorgeous just painting it might result in a horrific painting but ultimately it's about trying to achieve those scoring objectives you're trying to fit one of each type of symbol on your card you're trying to have these two symbols adjacent to each other on your card whatever the symbols whatever the various scoring objectives are it's a puzzle a puzzle that you're trying to accomplish it is simple it is rewarding i enjoy it this is one that's moved up to a four for me and i'm really really enjoying canvas it's a it's a lot of fun from there we have another lighter one, which is going to be Truffle Shuffle. Truffle Shuffle, another lighter family weight game that I've enjoyed playing this one. This one, uh, Ricky and my wife, Ricky and Rina, have enjoyed playing this far more than me. I like it. It's a three for me. I think they both gave it fours, if I'm not mistaken. They really like this game. The combination of theme and general set collection. It reminds me a bit of a game I reviewed at one point called... Enchanted Plumes. Enchanted Plumes is a game that I reviewed at one point. Both of them feature a bit of a, a kind of a, t a pyramid scheme as you try to grab things. In Truffle Shuffle, you're grabbing them from that pyramid. In Enchanted Plumes, you're building up the pyramid. But both of them have degrees of set collection and, and trying to figure out the way to score the cards together. I like Truffle Shuffle. I enjoy it. I think this will be around longer because my wife and daughter enjoy it. If they didn't, I probably wouldn't keep this one. I like it but I have lots of games that I like. Moving on, we have Chronicles of Drunagar. Again, another example of me not grabbing the big box because I don't want to grab the big box. Chronicles of Drunagar is going to be this box. This table's already getting completely unsustainable over here. Let's move that like this. We'll put this like that. Chronicles of Drunagar is a game that 
this is a tough one for me because of the fact that I'm not currently playing it. Now, I, I am currently playing it because of Apocalypse, because I currently have Apocalypse all ready to go for the upcoming Kickstarter. But Kronk's Zunagar is a game that is very hard to table. It's one that needs a dedicated table space. It's one that I really... I need a dedicated table space for campaign games. I need to have that accessibility available because otherwise these games I play five, six sessions and then I wrap it up and put it away. And Kronk's Zunagar is a game that I want to dive back into. I put out a review of this one. I give this one a four to five. My biggest reason for the five is going to be a combination of some aspects of the game being fiddly and then the, just the general table space and getting tabling this game is not something I look forward to doing. Once it's tabled, once it's out there, then I love it. So like, it's a ton of fun because the, the character progression, the character upgrading is so much fun. Every single time you finish a mission, you have a sense of progression in the game. You have a sense of moving forward in the game. Uh, in fact, a game that is going to be conspicuous, conspicuously missing up from this list is going to be Adventure Tactics. Adventure Tactics, I'm not confident that will stay in my collection, specifically with Chronicles of Junagar because, because of Chronicles of Junagar. You see, Adventure Tactics is a game that both Adventure Tactics and Chronicles of Junagar, it's probably a good idea for a play that's not that video, are going to give you a progression at the end of every mission. The difference between the two is I like the gameplay of, of Chronicles of Junagar more, I like the leveling up of Adventure Tactics, actually I like them both, I like the leveling up equally, but I like the gameplay of Chronicles of Junagar more. Both those games ultimately come down to the question of tabling them. Both of them involve setting them up, getting them ready to go, and then playing them. And since I'm playing Adventure Tactics with my children, it's up to them to decide if they want to keep playing it enough for me to actually keep it or not. So that's why it's not actually going to be on these lists, even though I do enjoy and recommend Adventure Tactics. Kronk's Zunagar is a lot of fun. The leveling up, the powers, the abilities. The monster variability, the base game is not great. You will need to introduce the expansions. But once you do so, the monster variability gets much higher. And they've done a good job in making it so you can merge things together. Contrary to many games that will say, use this monster, use that monster, and that's it. Kronk's Zunagar has a system where you use different colored monsters. So you're choosing different, a gray monster, a black monster, a white monster, that allows you to mix and match various expansion content easily into your game and get that variability without having that one random pack that introduces this type of monster that you never ever really see because there's like one scenario that uses it so i really appreciate the way the way that they've done it again i have critiques about the game but overall it's a system that i enjoy and a system that i believe will be sticking around for quite some time if only so that i can actually justify finishing it and going through the set and more than finishing it i want to try all the various classes there's a ton of classes all with their own sense of progression it's a this is not even fair moving on we have aquatica Aquatica is going to be a game where I have the expansion box because Jesse and Shira borrowed my base game box, and I'm annoyed because I like that game. Aquatica is going to be a game from 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 Arcane Wonders. This is a game that, again, I gave this one a five. This is one of my highlights of the year. The combination of good gameplay and the accessibility. The accessibility cannot be undersold. This is a game. Aquatica is a game that I can pull this out and play in 45 minutes, contrary to most, not most, every other game I've given a five out of five to in 2021, is not a game you can pull out and play in 45 minutes. So that put, that's why I enjoy Aquatica so much. Ultimately, it's a combination of tableau building. It's basically going to be a unique it's a hand management, like kind of like Concordia, kind of like Century Spice Road, where you have a hand of cards, you play them, and eventually you play a card that brings all the cards back to your hand. But each of those cards is doing different things in terms of managing your kingdom. You're going to be fighting different underwater kingdoms. You're going to be buying underwater kingdoms. You're going to be adding new characters to your tableau. You're going to be getting various abilities that will give you end game points as well as in game abilities and more tableau building. A lot of fun. I do really recommend recommend it with the cold waters i think that's what it's called with the cold waters expansion i think the cold waters expansion i think it's hard for me to say for sure where it would have landed because i played the base game once and then i immediately played it with the cold waters expansion and i haven't really gone back to the base game it's possible that without the cold waters expansion it would have been a four to five for me it's hard for me to say for sure because I move straight into the Cold Wars expansion. But overall, I can tell you that I like Aquatica either way, and if you took away the Cold Wars expansion, I'd still keep it. I don't know where it'd rate. We'd have to play that to find out. But I really enjoy Aquatica. I think it just had a reprint announced as well. I put this. A I did a recent video talking about my favorite games, and apparently lots of comments were that they couldn't get Aquatica. It's out of stock, but apparently they just had a reprint, so now you can get it. And lastly, on this list, which I think brings us to eight games, 18 games, I think we have 18 games on each list, is going to be Honey Buzz. Honey Buzz is a game... That, let's move this out of the way over here. Honey Buzz is a game that I really enjoy this one. I gave this one a four to five. My biggest complaint about this one was going to be the variability. In Honey Buzz, you're basically building out a hive. Now, some aspects of the game, the whole moving your bees around feels a bit fiddly. It works for the game. It does what it needs to do, which is why I like it. But that little aspect feels a bit fiddly. My bigger complaint is that even despite the varied goals, because you have different goals every game of how to build it your hive, of which things to go for, even despite the goals, I would say that I find that the base gameplay of Honey Buzz 
lacks the variability to keep it fresh and interesting in my collection long term. I really like it. I think it's excellent, but it's excellent the same way games like Splendor are excellent, the same way that games like Century Spice Road are excellent. Excellent in a way that there's a certain degree of elegant simplicity that I find in games that can make for incredibly rewarding experiences, but ones that don't last well over time, at least for myself. And Honey Buzz very much fits into that category. The reason it's on this list is twofold. One is, even with that, those games tend to last in my collection for a decent amount of time despite that. It's not that they go away right away, it's that a year and a half down the road, a game that I loved is gone, because that can happen. So it would be on this list either way, because I think I'll make it past the year mark regardless. That said, an additional reason to be on this list is that there are going to be expansions coming for this game. I do know that Elf Creek Games is putting out more content for Honey Buzz. I'm looking forward to that more content, because... Anything that augments and expands upon a game system that I already enjoy, anything that gives me more stuff to play with. Maybe it's different types of hive tiles. The hive tiles, they can, they can even just do that. If you had a variety of different types of hive tiles and the way they integrate it and mix up your experience, because of the way they do it with symbols only, you can easily plug and play different abilities into the mix. There's a lot of things you can do with this game, a lot of ways you can, imp you can develop and augment the game of Honey Buzz in a way that continues to make it enjoyable past its simple, solid, accessible gameplay. And that's going to be a wrap. We have 18 games, if I've counted correctly, on this list. Come back tomorrow where there will be 18 more. And when I say tomorrow, I mean that I'm going to put these games away and straight up go and film the next video. You'll notice the same shirt will be present. But for you... For you, it's going to be tomorrow. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and uh, have a good one.